can hear me loud and clear my name is Antonio Manessas and I'm going to be here with you this um, late afternoon in Guyana time and late evening in the UK London where I currently live so I'm looking forward to deliver this session to you on the natural gas supply and demand platform core VPI with which I have an incredible pleasure to to work with day in day out to deliver these um, free talks which are very important for you the viewers to understand what are the factors driving the natural gas uh, last time um, around we discussed the crude oil su um, supply and demand factors and as you will see um, these commodities both crude oil and natural gas can be um, similar in terms of exploration and production but um, different in the way that they are used so in this session in this session we will be drawing parallels to the differences between um, crude and natural gas with of course particular focus on natural gas to give you an overview a little bit more about my background I have a bachelor degree in petroleum uh, engineering so quite I was always quite biased to the oil and gas sector so um, I did a very technical course three four years in petroleum engineering where we discussed topics such as the three main um, st the three main stages within the oil and gas industry which are um, of course the upstream midstream and downstream in in this session we will depicted all these three sectors but starting of course with uh, exploration and production just like occurs with crude you will also occur with natural gas natural gas and crude these are um, natural commodities that you'll find in natural underground reservoirs and just a couple of notes by reservoir we are talking about a pocket of space that con uh, a room that contains pockets of space and uh, permeability i.e. the ability for the fluid to flow in a reservoir it's important to understand how these f how these fluids are distributed for example and um, they they will be distributed according to their gravity according to their physical properties in such a way that the heaviest one will be at the bottom and the lightest one will be at the top and as I can as you can imagine the lightest one will be um, will be natural gas and that will be at the top so it's very likely that in the reservoir depending on the type of reservoir you're going to have oil and water oil and gas once again depending on the type of reservoir so that is just to give you a little bit of a flavor on what to to, to expect when it comes to the technicalities um, or the reservoir characterization as we as we used to to call so after my bachelor in petroleum engineering i did my masters in energy trade and finance because i was too biased to oil and gas then i wanted to know a little bit more about um other sources of energy i wanted to know about renewables wind and solar and how they bake uh, and how these um multiple sources of um energy as we will see they are considered as primary energy demand or ped um, I wanted to, to see how these ones uh, uh, affect the whole energy sector rather than just oil and gas. So I did my masters in a very well accredited and known university in London um, from which I got um, uh, certifications as master in science and after that I was recruited by uh, data providing company also in London and my main task was to work with crude oil and products and I was responsible mainly for um, tracking the live cargoes of gasoline um, jet and diesel from multiple destinations across the world though I would focus uh, mainly in the US or cargoes going into the US but occasionally I would have a global overview of those cargoes and movements so that was my um, experience within a data 
company roughly for two years after that or most recently I joined uh, a company within the power and natural gas sector as a risk analyst if you are not aware the risk analyst role sits within the middle office so that's the segregation of office tasks within a corporate world is either back office where you're going to worry about um, contracts for example deal ticket entries or middle office where you work as a risk analyst and front office where you work as a, uh, a trader responsible for putting deals so i sit right in the middle and i communicate with the back office and the front office of course to make sure that i have the profit and losses um figures reconciliation so that i can make informed decisions on the power and gas market and how the company is performing when we buy certain amount when we buy um a ppa which is a power purchase agreement or when we and we, when we sell our power and gas so that is a little bit about um myself and what i do so without further ado let's jump to the natural gas supply and demand and as you can see natural gas has a very physical uh, property it has its own markets pricing structure as you will see and of course trading mechanisms um one of the questions that I get a lot is um, and to, we we have a comment which is good so uh, and I'm going to read these um, out loud okay um, and just to just to point out um, just to point out uh, something that I mentioned at the very beginning the special thanks goes to the Georgetown capital and they are the ones organizing these um uh, these free webinars so thank you thank you very much for um this correction and let's give all the props and all the the positive points to the georgetown um capital and those are the guys which will provide um all the necessary material to make sure that you stay tuned to these webinars many more of these to come and many more to be enjoyed as I was saying so for the physical um, properties of the uh, natural gas many people tend to ask me Antonio what's the difference between the crude oil and the natural gas market and what are the similarities I tend to to start with the similarities because um, both as we did picture at the beginning both have very distinct physical properties but they do possess a physical property as opposed to uh, power for instance when you start digging into the power market it's a whole different concept but in terms of similarities the way that you extract um, natural gas and crude is pretty much the same so you have the um, the the way that you do it is we have a whole process when it comes to um, exploration and the, the process is very similar so you drop geophones into a seabed or you conduct seismic readings and then from those seismic readings you'll be able to see where your um, where, where where the flu kind of gives you an indication let's say if it is on the sea where the seabed gives you an indication that depending on the type of rock you have an accumulation of oil and gas remember in a reservoir it's very possible that you're going to find all three components oil water and gas or if you have a completely dry gas reservoir you will only find gas if you have a condensate you might find um, condensate implies gas and water and of course you have the black oil reservoir that is just um, that is oil but of course once again you might have a reservoir with all three components and it's very important that these three fluids crude oil water and natural gas undergo physical and chemical um, treatment to make sure that they segregate it from one another once they are extracted from underground reservoirs so that's for the 
kind of the similarities they have this uh, uh, a similar way of extracting but they in terms of differences they have a little bit more in terms of physical and chemical um, separation processes as you can imagine they will be separated based on their physical properties density for example is one of them um, oil being heavier then it will require higher physical and pressure temperatures but a lot of that is something that you can grab and read from a book what i'm here to 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 give you insight of is the things that you really don't hear much about you know um in, in the market or when you're having a casual conversation um with with colleagues um that are also in that commodity market you might not be familiar of the difference in in the market structure or market participants when it comes to natural gas uh, markets and crude market um the n the natural gas can be very very uh, a regional market with a global outlook and what i mean by that regional market because for example in the uk you might have a different party or a different organization that is responsible for um uh, for regulating the the market in the uk we have the off jam so off jam is the office for gas and electricity markets those are the ones that regulate the market to make sure that uh, pricing is transparent just like in the crude oil you have for example opec and opec they manage the supply and the demand so that you can reach a price balance so you can see from a definition these two bodies off jam and opec uh, they are basically doing the same thing but for different markets OPEC for the crude oil market and Ofchem in the UK for the uh, the office for ele gas and electricity markets um, that's uh, w another striking difference between the two commodities they have different markets different markets entail different participants and when it comes to pricing pricing structure for crude oil uh, dollars per barrel can be much more straightforward and in fact, it is much more straightforward than pricing natural gas. And we will see for natural gas, there are a lot of factors, a lot of pricing formulas out there um, that influence the um, prices and the, yeah, the pricing of uh, natural gas. And of course, trading as such, because pricing is different than trading, of course, will also be different. Um, for crude oil, you have vessels carrying your barrels of crude, uh, either physical trading or uh, financial trading. Although for natural gas, you also have financial trading, but when it comes um, to for the physical trading, you you have specific vessels carrying your your gas but at the same time you have the transportation difference between um, LNG because you need to liquefy your gas to be able to move from let's say Sabine Pass in the US to uh, an area of the Mon in China for example or you have pipelines which pipelines they tend to connect your gas supply to areas of the Mon within regions or um, in Europe for instance you have um, Nord Stream pipeline coming out of Russia through um, Germany and that is what is feeding the um, the European market Russia is a major player as we will see so all these four factors that we have here they um, they create um, the they create what we describe the supply and demand factors for natural gas now moving on to the next slide just to understand a little bit more about the actual physical properties that i was meant that i was referring to so when it comes to um gas production so we saw that um like in this slide what we have is like or the process that we have for oil and gas well in terms of um, in terms of extraction out of a uh, out of a well a well is basically the borehole that you dig so that you can drop your tools your um let's say logging tools to make sure that you can do a scanning of the um of the formation that's basically what you do for both oil and gas you dig up a well and you throw and you drop your logging tools and you get a reading of the um, of the surface once you've identified 
the that this borehole has crude natural gas and water then you put this into a separation stage so you can see the separation stage you have the oil the water and um, you, you, what you want to do is basically apply pressure and temperature so that you can actually flat um, so that you can separate that gas or you can break those fractions and send for instance the gas into a gas processing plant where you're going to have for example metals or um, any other contaminant uh, removed from natural gas or removed from oil and basically this undergoes multiple multiple um, processes what I want you also to focus is this underground storage reservoir because you will see further down in this webinar that one of the main issues or one of the main reasons that prices of natural gas uh, particularly in Europe are spiking just like power it's because the united kingdom the uk does not hold much storage for natural gas and it relies on um imports of natural gas via pipeline or via um, um lng shipping from russia and lng shipping would be the through the deals that we have with norway for instance but pipelines storage ability it's very very important and you can see that a lot of terminals um, and by terminal i mean where the vessels uh, dock so they can distribute they are lng equipped for storage what what that means lng needs to be storage because it's gas liquefied gas if that loses pressure then it loses its properties and we don't want that to happen to our gas because why the quality of gas is very very important for electricity generation for power generation and that is something that we uh, that it's one of the main uses of natural gas is mainly used for uh, power generation and that will power your domestic sector for example your home is going to power commercial sectors is going to power industrial um, sectors that is exactly why you have the natural gas production transmission and distribution all the way to the consumer lines um, that I just mentioned domestic residential commercial and of course industrial uh, the difference here is the the sizes for instance the company that I work for uh, we are within the uh, commercial and uh, industrial sector so we're talking about mid small to uh, to medium sized businesses rather than domestic so um, domestics are those suppliers that will supply gas and electricity for instance to your house whereas for us being uh, within the industrial and commercial what we are going to do is to enter into contract agreement with generators let's say with solar farms or wind farms provide power purchase agreements for five or for even up to 20 years in a way of saying that hey we, we know that your site generates this X amount of power. We want to buy that from you, but we want to have a contract that is uh, uh, that will last for 20 years and a strike price for your what we are going to do is to forecast the prices of um, of power, the power prices. After forecasting that we are going to say that's the power price that we're going to buy your um that we're going to to buy at so let's fixate this power purchase agreement this ppa at this strike price x or y so if the price drops below uh if the price drops below that um agreed price we will review the the policies that are in place to know who is going to pay who but if the price is above then you're going to pay uh, then you're going to pay us for for that difference so it's very likely or what, what happens more often than not is when the price um, is above that fixate and you have a contract for difference whereby um, the parties that generate 
the the power they are the ones paying us whereas if the price is below that strike price for the contract for difference then we make sure that we review the policies um by in the uk we also have another body called alexon and those are the ones who deal with the imbalance settlement so um when it comes to local rules in your country is important first of all to understand who is the gas and electricity market regulator in your country who is the uh, party or the organization responsible for um doing for dealing with the imbalance settlement in the uk you have alexon and for us in the uk also the generate or the regulator for the market is um off gem and these two bodies they tend to communicate with each other because they operate under different codes for example alexon will follow a different um will follow the bsc will follow bsc code and um of gem will follow a national grid code a national grid if you can imagine the national grid as the motorways for your power and electricity so basically what the national grid does is to make sure that areas of supply um distribute the power to areas of demand so that's um another structure of the gas market the regulators and 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 of course the uh policy writers when it comes to uh imbalance settlement gas needs to be um when, once gas in is in the system it needs to be balanced pretty constantly areas of supply needs to uh distribute that gas to areas of demand and gas is used for electricity um generation so you cannot let's go from the principle that okay apart from batteries electricity needs to be uh, needs to be used right there and then from that point of view it means that every half hour that is going to have a settlement period there is going to have a settlement period because electricity can it cannot be um stored within this uh, fast paced system of supply and demand so the system will have to be constantly balanced and that is basically what um the national grid does when it comes to electricity and on the right hand side i just have a, uh, the natural gas facts figures and definitions so that you are aware what comprises natural gas because we're talking that is gas okay but what is it um in terms of um definition it's basically an hydrocarbon but a lighter hydrocarbon than crude oil because we look at that in terms of number of carbons methane one carbon ethane two propane three if you did your chemistry class then very likely that you're familiar with these names but if not this is the right place to um uh to be as georgetown capital provides this once again free webinars um on multiple commodities and of course the uses a reminder that natural gas is used as a feedstock and what we mean as a feedstock it simply means that you're going just like crude oil is used as a feedstock for multiple fractions and um, for multiple products like gasoline diesel and jet natural gas is also used as a feedstock which i'm going to share with you a couple of units that we need to be um uh that we need to pay attention to when referring to natural gas crude oil is in dollars per barrel uh natural gas can have um as you can see can have different uh units megawatts hour standard mmbtus also standard um cubic feet it is also used all these units are used different units are used all you need to do is to use and or to find the right conversion factor to make sure that you're working from one unit to another but you are basically conveying the same information
in terms of um, sectors of demand, really, um, that is something that we did picture very quickly. But you can see at the bottom of, at the bottom left, you have the types of consumer, size of consumers, number, seasonality, and competing fuels, and of course the te uh, the technical risk. So these factors i gave you an overview of background but let's go from the residential industrial transport and power generation so crude oil is mainly used um in that for industrial purposes and for transportation because the fractions like gasoline and diesel those are used for road vehicles right now for natural gas a little bit more diverse because you have different types of consumers residential and commercial homes and small businesses natural gas is used to heat up your homes and small businesses industrial you use natural gas for um, uh, metallurgical processes aluminium smelting cement manufacture for transport you have there is the dilemma on co2 um emissions which is really not a dilemma but more of an issue because we need to reduce co2 um, emissions now which fuel do we use for such gasoline and diesel in the uk for instance there are areas of where you can no, no longer drive your car powered by fossil fuels like um gasoline or or diesel right and um, th these are areas that you will need to drive your evs your electrical vehicles you buy a tesla and you'll be able to 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 drive on the in those roads here in the uk so there is a cap on carbon emissions and the uk is very is fully aware of that so um when it comes to gas it potentially we're talking more towards maritime transportation that is exactly why uh, you see lng liquefied natural gas or um cng which is compressed natural gas so uh, our focus for today will be on lng because that's one of the main drivers for natural gas um demand is mainly lng versus uh pipeline and the reason that we that we have this distinction is because um it will impact the pricing of natural gas lng for instance if you use lng to burn um to 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 burn in your engine so that it can generate the necessary power for it for your vessel then it has to have the specific uh, calorific content to make sure that is equivalent with um uh, AJ, hsfo for example and hsfo is the um um fuel oil high fuel oil high sulfur fuel oil so high sulfur fuel oil literally was capped um in 2020 jan 2020 after imo the maritime organization and that 2020 imo was for sulfa reduction from the vessels um from from the fuels on the vessels that's why fuel oil which is a heavy um fraction of crude oil crude oil it's no longer applicable now you vessels need to use either um lng or they need to um they 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 look into to power their engines with lng or they're using a lower spec fuel oil which is low sulfur fuel oil or ultra low sulfur fuel oil and of course you would use natural gas for power generations power stations remember ccgt uh, or ocgt ccgt combined cy um, cycle gas turbine and open cycle gas turbine so these two technologies are the ones that are going to drive the um, uh, gas to coal um, uh, or coal to gas uh, changes and of course talking about gas that's why you're going to feed your power plant with because it burns cleaner than coal it burns cleaner than um, crude oil now looking at the size of each customer for residential and um, 
and you compare residential for instance with uh, transport customers uh, or even with industrial you have a difference between small and large so for commercial we tend to to say that um it's smaller in size in terms of megawatts produced for industrial businesses the intensity of uh, the the intensity and hours um that you need are much um uh, the the processes are much more intense whereas for re uh, for residential for example we tend to say that natural gas for electricity generation has a very residential profile which is um you wake up and you put your kettle to make your cup of tea or uh, to make your your coffee in the morning seven if you don't work from home let's put COVID aside if you need to go to the office then it means that your residential electricity consumption at home would be very low but one so it'll be very low from what time from 7 a.m potentially until 5 or 6 p.m and that's the time that you're coming back home and then your electricity consumption profile uh, driven or derivated from uh, natural gas will be different from 5 p.m onwards because at that time again you'll be at home you'll be watching your tv you'll be cooking for instance so that's why we tend to say that in terms of size um of each customer it's small it's more toward the megawatt of electricity that you need um industrial again processes even though processes most industries tend to run from eight to five or nine to six then it's a very very intensive process for uh smelting for um for for uh, gen uh for metals for instance it's a very very intense intensive um electricity demanding um process then we have the seasonal demand potentially high for residential once again as explained in the point above it there is a seasonality to to it hourly seven o'clock you put in your coffee from seven or from eight o'clock and eight a.m until 5 p.m you're not at home then you don't need that gas in your system to generate um power anymore then commercial some shops when the shops are open or when the shopping center are open they need they need to have that clientele in so they need to have um, a lot of contract agreements so that's where my company sits industrial and commercial so we charge our customers for a shape fee and shape we refer to um how uh the consumption of each um or of each consumer for example each consumer will have a different shape profile will have a different consumption competing fuels remember interfuel competition plays a big part when it comes to um pricing of any commodity so the general rule of thumb is if you have the abundance of a commodity that is cheaper that is cleaner and that is more abundant then the price for that commodity will potentially be cheaper now cheaper price of a commodity what is it going to do is going to drive higher um supply is going to uh to 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 drive higher supply because supply is a function on production and if the price of the commodity is cheaper to produce cheaper to distribute then we will opt for that commodity look at biomass it's a competing fuel for residential heavy fuel oil as we a hfo um as we mentioned even though it has a low cost of electricity but it requires uh, um, it's not the cleanest source of electricity transportation what is competing with cng for cars you have diesel and gasoline and for power generation you have different types of power generations you have the ccgt oc oc um ocgt you have uh, these are fossil fuel plants but you also of course have nuclear renewable um coal plants which we mentioned that those are the ones driving the gas to coal or coal to gas um switching a couple more technicals here really on the technical um risk and the technical risk can be uh more often than not associated to the technicality of operating these um of operating these uh, process so 
uh, there is a low technical risk when it comes to residential for example because as a consumer you're at home and you are the end user so you don't you're not dealing directly uh, you're not dealing directly with um, with any power grid so to speak and but we can see that for transportation is low to medium because there's a technical element to EVs the electric vehicles that you need to produce so that they can circulate on the road so there is the technicality that is associated to the technology um, development now we have a couple of slides to power through today, but I just want to show you a couple of points that we've been talking um, that we've been talking in the previous point. How to conduct a market analysis? Um, very likely, if you attended the crude oil market, you will draw some parallels, some similarities to you know these two markets, but it is basically very very similar. you will have natural gas supply and we saw that supply is a is a function of production you have natural gas demand and demand is a function of consumption so areas of uh, production need to be connected or need to be linked to um, areas of consumption and more often than not if it is regional you might have pipelines you might have local pipelines from the production area to the to um areas or centers of distribution that is going to go to um where uh is going to go to residential uh properties or to other types of sites like we saw commercial or industrial when it comes to price though for crude oil we saw that you have opac balancing the supply and demand here you have a multiple formulas for gas pricing seasonality we can look at the slide on the right as well we see a seasonal and daily uh, demand variations and we saw that these are this is your period for power demand midnight uh, through um, 24 hours a day and you can see the profile for the first three hours is quite low and then it starts to peak from 6 a.m. and that's the period that you know you are up and ready to go to work but then from it starts to drop basically from 8 or 9 and then it starts to pick again at the end of the day let's call this uh, 17 or 5 p.m. and that's when when you basically come back from work and from then it drops um, again because these are these are the periods that you're you're sleeping and you don't need that and you don't need that much gas for electricity or for heat um, generation so these are the two main uses of natural gas electricity and heat generation so uh, houses including my own house for instance we use gas central heating meaning that our heaters they operate on gas rather than electricity seasonality hourly daily and we can this is basically if you can imagine if you can replicate this uh graph which is a hourly graph now replicate this on so uh, hourly which has a daily profile now bring this to a weekend um a weekend um that's what we call basically uh off peaks right um and peaks will be um anything between um uh, for a commercial or industrial is going to be anything between 7 a.m. to 7 uh, p.m. because businesses whilst residential we are out of our houses but businesses you can imagine that they peak at the times that people like ourselves go to the office so this is the point that I was mentioning that um, there is a daily influence or daily seasonality to it power cannot be easily stored if it is not 
needed immediately than is um, better not to generate and that is basically what the national grid does if you can imagine the national grid as kind of the center operator or the the system operators what they see is the, what what they able to see is the uh, demand of electricity in the system and if demand surpasses supply the power plants which were offline might get a, a call from national grid and say that hey we are seeing um we are seeing extreme demand in the system and we have a very low supply at the moment can you come online and generate x amount of electricity so that you know we can meet this demand that's basically how it works refinery operations for um for gas is not too different gas still used as a feedstock not too different from crude oil i must say because in terms of refinery process even though you have a, a more lengthy process for crude oil when it comes to separations of multiple fractions for natural gas because it's separated at the front then you have the separation chamber and that is going to separate for example your um uh, the, the the light gas fractions methane from the natural gas liquids the NGLs for example which are the butanes and uh, and all these and all these products remember sustainability which is related to the environmental uh, environmental concerns and interfuel competition uh, environmental concerns they will drive interfuel competition the ability to generate um, or to pay lower prices for your gas it comes under affordability and when it comes to affordability I put in Europe you have Russia um, Russia holds a strong hand in the gas market in Europe because they are one of the major gas producers in the world and particular being in the European region what they're able to do is to uh, switch on and off their taps so that means that they can deprive or they can supply Europe from having gas and that um, starvation of gas into the system it's basically what drives the prices up and that is the rule of thumb for a commodity if you have too much of a commodity prices go and uh, uh, prices go down if you have too little of a commodity and there is higher demand then prices uh, go up security of supply you need to make sure that you're able to book your lng cargoes because they tend to divert and lng cargoes will divert for from areas of uh poor pricing to areas of more or higher arbitrage so that instead of you selling your cargo at um, uh, instead of you selling your cargo at X amount, then you're going to go to another region and you're going to be able to um, to sell your cargo. But that is, of course, if your cargo is not already contracted. So one of the key assumptions here is the existence of free cargos that are available to be contracted right there and then. And of course, the public opinion on intermittent sources or uh, uh, intermittent renewable sources, or even gas as a transition fuel, which is important for COP26. And COP26 is the um, October meeting that the world leaders um, uh, that the uh, the world leaders had to try and curb CO2 uh, emissions. And they have, they have identified gas as a transition fuel for being cheaper cleaner abundant and all the properties that we discussed before and what drives uh, uh, the drivers and the players uh, so what we have on the right is the gas to power market competition from other fuels and you can see that the difference between gas nuclear oil coal and wind and this graph is a very good graph it's a spider graph that really shows um, uh, multiple comparison points between between all these five types of commodities if you look at the positive or the advantage points for uh, natural gas and you compare that let's say to um, nuclear you will see that natural gas for example in terms of regulation for safety um, has a much 
higher regulation for safety than nuclear nuclear disasters they are big disasters you don't want to be anywhere ne near a nuclear power plant if they if there is uh if there is a uh, an issue when it comes to to safety um in terms of um, environmental friendliness even though we say that is um that is cleaner than coal for example that you can see coal in terms of environment safety it's very low but don't forget that natural gas is still a hydrocarbon you still need to dig to dig down um, in the ground or in the seabed and extract it and to do that you need to pump a lot of chemicals to make sure that you can extract that um, gas um, from from the reservoir so even though we tend to say that is a transition fuel but do not forget that it still carries an element of hydrocarbon so it's not a hundred percent clean but surely surely cleaner than coal for instance which has higher higher carbons and yes we tend to compare wind with uh with with all the sources as well because in terms of uh in terms of fuel availability um you have in terms of safety in terms of environmental uh it does have an element of technical um of technicality to it because you need to put your wind turbines either in the middle of the sea so or or inland so you can imagine that the capital costs for that are quite high but the opex once you lay the whole structure either in land or on the sea can be lower but the capital um, expenses f um, can be quite high for um, for wind what drives the trade similarly to crude oil trades um natural gas is traded both physically and financially financially you have different markets you have um ice into continental um exchange you have nymex new york mercantile exchange or ha you have the cme chicago mercantile exchange that you can trade derivative products and there are multiple trading strategies here uh, like um just like for for crude you have um uh contango or you have a backwardation and contango is basically when the future price is higher uh, than the current market price and backwardation is the opposite so according to these prices you set your strategy um accordingly so we're almost we are almost um to the end so what what i want to to discuss is how has the technology shaped the the gas industry with these areas of demand um which we saw before really the residential um consumption residential and commercial industrial and agriculture commercial consumption and for transport uh, cng for vehicles gas to liquid and lng for um all these for power generation one of the technologies really is the lng lng has revolutionized uh, this the this industry and alongside you have really the the steps that are involved in a lng supply chain from gas mining similar to oil mining to lng production it's really gas production because you need to um put it in a cryogenic tank to make sure that you liquefied a certain uh, temperature and that is basically how you store it right and when you transport it then it also needs to be a certain temperature because we have what we call the boil off of natural gas if the temperature is not correct just like the temperature in your fridge if you leave your fridge open then the temperature starts to dissipate you start losing temperature and you don't want to lose that temperature with natural gas lng because you're losing calorific value meaning when it reaches the when you're transporting and it reaches the areas of consumption let's say if it is going to a power plant then it's not going to be able to burn properly to generate the amount of electricity ccgt what is it it's a combined cycle gas turbine it's a technology just like um open cycle uh, gas turbine but um what 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 it does is com 
it combines two cycles uh, for uh, heat and electricity generation so you have a little bit of explanation here uh, what it does but basically um, it's the feedstock for power plant you feed natural gas natural gas is burned it generates heat heat will fire up the 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 um, the turbine or yeah the, the the gas turbine and both an electricity will be generated and you can see why it's popular low cost of capital the capex is lower fast setup and it's efficient when we talk about um consumers and suppliers we we need to know who we who really we we talking about here right so when we look at the um, exporters for instance we can see the at the in the bottom graph whether they export mainly via pipeline or via lng and we can see that russia um it's a major major exporter of uh, gas but via pipeline why because as we discussed it has all the pipelines in Europe and it can uh, it has a major major hand when it comes to supply um, of gas within the European market and in terms of um, also top exporters if we just highlight the the top um, let's say the top six so that we can see the difference look at russia and then compare russia to australia australia is probably as we see 100 percent um or 99.9 percent um of the gas is exported via lng it is exported via lng so even though we're talking about um exportation what we 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 also need to know is that pipelines can also be uh, used for um exportation of course right especially when we talk about russia and um, Nord stream pipeline to going to germany and that's basically how you export gas through a pipeline in this case we are saying that australia exports its gas via lng exclusively and you have Russia, uh, mainly uh, pipeline. You have Qatar, which is basically, Qatar is a major, major player in the gas business, which has um, LNG. L Qatar has long-term contracts of LNG with Europe, and these are to be transported, um, of course, via um, uh, LNG but these are long-term contracts most of them are indexed for uh, 20 years but it's important to know whether these contracts are reaching their limit and whether other countries will try to uh, pick their spot to become uh, the exporter into a uh, much uh, area of demand like uh, the uk then you also have for instance the us and Canada, Canada exclusively pipelines. And who are the importers? It's not a surprise that the importers are really far east, right? So we see Japan. Japan is a major importer of natural gas because they lack from indigenous um, resources. Like natural gas is one of the resources that they don't naturally have. So they need to import and they import via LNG. You have Germany, Russia and Germany um, relationship. Germany imports uh, mainly via pipeline. And, you, uh, and if you had a guess, it would be from Russia, much more like the rest of Europe does so. Uh, uh, China is also a major importer of um, LNG. And who are the consumers? The consumers are... Um, are the US is a major consumer of um, gas, not necessarily a distinction between LNG or pipeline, but just as a whole, US consumes a lot of gas. Um, you also uh, have um, countries like in Europe, Germany and the UK, those are major consumers of gas and in Asia Pacific you have China and Japan leading the way of consumers 
Middle East, Iran and um, Saudi Arabia are major, major consumers, whilst Qatar is a major exporter. And just to wrap up our session, because we mentioned um, the price, we don't have a price fit for all. This is not like crude oil where um, OPEC is balancing the, the, the pricing, but you know, uh, you need to pay the, uh, the, uh, the equivalent dollars per barrel um, for, for crude oil. Here you have different indicative for gas prices. You have uh, J um, JKM, which is the Japan Korea market uh, market. That is a, a marker that is used by um, Japan and Korea to price their um, LNG cargoes accordingly. So that's basically how you price gas. So if you look at the very bottom, you can see that the world gas consumption and imports by pricing method, they differ a lot. They have different schematics or different uh, prices index o OPE oil price escalation or gas on gas these are the two main ones and you can see in this graph for example the world consumption uh, gas on gas is basically uh, let let's take the us as a predominant or as a good example us is gas on gas because they have a very well developed henry henry um hub the henry hub is a gas hub that allows um trades uh, that allows na uh, natural gas trading so gas is allowed to compete wi within gas on gas competition whereas oil price escalation OPE that's basically what we're saying with OPE is I'm going to price my gas according to the price of crude oil that is what we meant what we mean by oil price escalation so if the price of crude goes up so that's the price of um of natural gas and um regionally you also have uh, um for example when we're talking about um african countries or african nations you might have regulation social political where the price of gas and the, the the pricing of gas will be associated to some major regulatory social and political um factor so the most um common gas prices indexes that we use for example in far east will be the jkm or um japan korean marker will be the henry hub in the us the dutch ttf um title transfer funds and in the uk the nbp and i say that these are the most common ones because they tend to be the more liquid they have a lot of players and they tend to 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 have um uh, physical hubs rather than virtual hubs for example the um german average german price that is not as well as developed as the ttf the henry hub or the nbp which have physical hubs with higher liquidity and they have been set up for or a much longer period so the takeaway from here is the different type of pricing formulas and you can really see the correlation right between um this these uh, all these uh, factors if we just take for example let's look for the nbp which is the purple or line nbp is uk and you take the dutch uh, uh ttf you can see that they have a a, a very similar correlation likewise when we look at the um at the uh, Henry hub where one is up the other one is also up the major difference here you can see the units dollar per mm BTU the major difference here might be the abundance as well of gas in the US with the development of shell gas and the abundance of a commodity remember it means that you are able to sell your commodity at a much lower price and that is the infiltration of both shell gas and shell oil into the economy of a country into the economy of the US and the trading capabilities and that's basically what is going to affect the pricing of natural gas so just to summarize and i'm going to go back to the very first slide where we saw the natural gas supply and demand 
factors we discussed the physical properties the market or how the gas markets are structured the pricing and the trading factors so very glad that you tuned in i'm very glad that you listened to this um webinar i promise that at the end of this session i would put a face to a name so i'm going to stop for everybody who has heard who, about the crude oil market and is um, interested to learn a little bit more about crude so let's go on let's go on to understanding the crude oil what is actually crude oil and this is important because a lot of these properties crude oil is a it's a physical commodity it is different than a financial derivative that we are going to see a little bit uh, further down the, the the slides because financial derivatives are traded or um yeah th those are traded electronically so more often than not you don't actually hold um you don't see those contracts physically you, you 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 simply don't but we crude is much more different crude is a physical commodity is a mixture of hydrocarbons hc stands for hydrocarbons a lot of people a lot of old folks in the industry they call it the black gold fluid which is hidden in underground reservoirs now because i have a background in petroleum engineering then this is kind of my field i can go hours and hours and hours talking about conventional and conventional reservoirs um, and the type of reservoirs and whatnot but for the purpose of this one hour session that we have at least for the next 15 minutes or so we're going to um, go into a general overview and then again uh, link uh link with us on the multiple channels that we have the george uh, the georgetowncapital.com is one of them uh, get in touch with us by commenting on our facebook page by um uh, hitting us up on armcore vpi email we have so many ways of getting in touch with us so yes um physical commodity underground reservoirs conventional and unconventional why am i telling you that because this talk today it's about supply and demand and the supply side of crude oil is very much driven by these physical properties of crude oil and the reservoir that is the crude oil is contained and what is reservoir i'm going to give you the scientific explanation and then i'm going to give you the basic uh, down to earth concept because that's what we are doing here the basic down to earth concept is that a reservoir is nothing more than a pocket of space where crude oil um, is uh, stored it's hidden just like crude oil um, water and gas these are processes which formed millions and millions and millions of years ago heat um high pressure high temperature then trapped crude in underground reservoirs now the high level definition includes porosity and permeability porosity again pocket of space permeability ability of the fluid to flow why is this important because it defines what a conventional reservoir is and unconventional reservoir your conventional reservoir is if you want to imagine is basically like a donut um a, a donut the, the the food you know where you put a rig and as soon as you drill through a donut or as soon as you poke through a donut then you're going to see the cream or the j or the jam or the jelly flowing 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 out nothing fancy right it's just a donut you drill and then it's easy to find the oil and gas however unconventional that's when we start talking about shale gas tight gas sand for example in canada and why does uh why does that impact the supply because it's uh, it's so tight it's unconventional and it's not your conventional type of extracting crude oil then you will need to price the costs of extraction hence your supply will be a function of production depending on how much you can produce for, from these unconventional conventional reservoirs that's how much you're going to be able to supply to the market now many types of reservoirs dry gas reservoir because one of the examples here that we have is for example in russia russia is very rich in uh, dry gas reservoir that is exactly why they are able to supply gas into europe 
um, especially now with uh, with a very controversial Nord Stream pipe flowing from Russia through Ukraine and Germany and now there's geopolitical tension that is the dry gas we will see a lot of these factors um, a little bit further down the, the 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 slides you will have condensate reservoirs condensate reservoirs are those annoying reservoirs you know the ones that it it is not dry gas but it's not a black oil model but is more um it will require more of what we call enhanced oil recovery eor to try to extract the dry gas from the oil you can imagine costs associated to it because enhanced oil recovery those are chemical and physical processes for separation so even though that you might be thinking okay this sounds a lot of the chemistry of physics class that i had back in the fourth or sixth or fifth grade that's what petroleum engineers basically do behind the computer screen or when we go to the field we need to analyze the rocks we need to analyze the reservoirs and that's um that's something that we simply do to in order to quantify how much profit we can get from that reserve of, cr of crude oil uh, and then, of course, we have the black oil uh, model reservoir, which is basically what we want to, to find. Black oil model, that in implies that you have oil, uh, water, and gas at the very top. So, uh, and that is according to the density, right? The heaviest one will be at the bottom, and, depending, um, and then oil tends to be heavier than water. So, oil at the bottom, water, and then gas will be the lighter fraction of crude oil, of, um, of uh, hydrocarbons that is going to be on top of the water and on top of the, um, and on top of the, the, the crude oil. Again, very, very important stuff, the physical and the chemical properties. Now... As we, as we mentioned in the next point, the physical commodity is driven by physical properties. So for content, now we're getting into, we're starting to get into the high level concepts because uh, at some point in the crude oil industry, you will hear the concept of sweet versus sour crude okay what is a sweet crude what is a sour crude a sweet crude is a crude that has a sulfur content less than 0.5 percent why is this important um let's just put that way sulfur metals those are not good for your crude they reduce the quality of your crude they kill every um when, when you put the crude into the crude distillation unit the cdu if you have um, all these more sulfur content more metals then automatically you are incurring more costs because you need more costs for separations yeah that's the bottom line sweet versus sour crude then i'm going to share with you um, an excel file which basically shows um, that is going to be um, let me see if i can put files in these um, in this comment section Possibly I can, but if not, once again, I'm going to, um, to to share with you later on after this session. But it's basically to for you to understand why these um, sulfur content, density, specific gravity are important. And I'm going to give you an example of a very well-known Brent crude which is the benchmark that Guyana uses to price uh, um, its crude. Sweet and sour related to sulfur content. Density and specific gravity, um, those will refer to how heavy or how light a crude is. So you can have a combination, right, of light sweet or light sour, heavy sweet or heavy sour. And then the viscosity is just how viscous, how resistant to flow your crude is. But the main ones that I want you to take today is the sulfur content and the density as well as the specific um, gravity. And why is this important? Because from these 
um, sulfur content from these physical properties, you will have multiple grades of crude. So we are indirectly, or if you want actually directly, we're starting to dive a little bit into the supply factor. So you can imagine that the supply are very much associated to production and production is a function of the physical um, properties of the physical commodity. Crude oil is a physical commodity. Repetition brings perfect repetition brings perfection that's what it is many international benchmarks why do we need benchmarks because each country has its own crude slate and by crude slate we usually refer to um, grades of crude for example we have brand crude the brand crude is produced uh, produced in the UKCS UK continental shelf um, shelf and that is a UK or the North Sea uh, benchmark against which many 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 world crudes will compare it themselves against so that they do not deviate or skew too much from the pricing or when they are pricing their crudes for example if you want to price an algerian light sweet crude um, then you were going to use the brand crude the wti or the dubai for um, middle east and crude grade depending on where your the, where your cargo is heading to so um yeah in, in this file that i have i'm going to read a little bit um on the opec countries opec is the um, organization for the countries that uh, uh, produce petroleum and uh, these countries are very important or the organization uh, rather is very important because it regulates it controls the supply and the money in the market in order to achieve uh, a balance a uh, balance in the price otherwise each country will produce it, um, its own crude um, at its own price and supply and demand will be imbalanced therefore massive chaos in the market moving on to our slide number two now um yeah, I just uh, I, I just wanted to uh, because Gayata actually uses uh, Brent crude as a, as a benchmark. I just want you to take notes if you can of the uh, the quality of Brent blend of the Brent crude. It is a light sweet crude and. If I just go back to the previous slide, you're going to see this relationship. High density means low API gravity. API is American Petroleum In Institute, and that is a standard for, um, for quantifying this physical property of heavy versus light crude okay so the higher the density means low api gravity so light sweet means that it has a grav a high gravity because uh high gravity means low density low density hence light uh, sweet means 0.5 so this is the association that i want you to have high density low api gravity but uh, brand crude has a high api gravity high api gravity is anything above 20. um so brand crude has an api gravity between 30 and 40 which means that it has low density low density implies that is a light crude and in terms of sweetness how sweet or sour it is it is a sweet crude because it has a sulfur content less than five percent so now you know and to be more specific the sulfur content is between 0 0.2 uh, is between 0 0.2 to uh, 0.3 percent on to the next slide um, we go and i from this slide i want to show you the industry um, tiers how the industry is structured so uh the way that the industry is structured and that really this really takes uh, brings back memories from my underground in uh, by my my um bachelor in the, in petroleum which is um basically how the industry is structured upstream midstream downstream bang on what is upstream what is midstream what is downstream and why are these important upstream by now you should have a, an idea of what 
ENP exploration and production. Why are these important? Remember, crude is a physical property, physical is a, is a physical commodity with physical properties, then upstream the way that you're going to explore crude. I can give you a couple of tips, why not? Just to pretend that I know a little bit about my things, you know? I know my things. Now, exploration. There are a couple of stages that are involved in the exploration. The very first one will be the seismic. You, you, um, geophysicists, the very smart guys, they just tend to drop a lot of geophones and or even satellites imagery to try to locate crude oil because crude oil is a mixture of um, it's a mixture of chemicals than the geophones that they actually put let's say that they put geophones in a seabed you can see that there is a boat there is a vessel here very likely that this vessel what is actually doing is it has buoys and these buoys uh, they have geophones attached to them that connect to the surface of the to to the connect to the seabed what they're going to do is that they're going to take reading of the subsurface and they're going to send that um, they're going to send that to labs and they're going to be able to analyze the structure of the seabed and say that okay according to those properties of the crude oil remember of the reservoir porosity the pocket of space permeability the ability of the fluid to flow then we can identify the type of rock is permeable and it can accumulate oil that's basically what exploration is costs money to drop these geophones it costs money to um to have those satellite imagery and of course according to the next stage now that you drop the geophones now that you um now that you know that there is crude oil what is the next stage that's when you start the the appraisal so you have the exploration phase which is to drop the geophones or the uh, satellites imagery satellites to try to identify the next stage will be the appraisal the appraisal is when you start to quantify okay I know that I have this size um, of my reservoir. Now, how much can it produce? The next stage after appraisal is the development. That's when you start drilling, developing wells. I'm pretty sure, or if you haven't heard uh, by now, now you know. Um, every A well is basically uh, w w when you're drilling on the floor. It's a hole that you drill on the floor or on the seabed. When I mean on the floor, I mean in land. On the land, when I mean seabed is on the sea, basically what you have here. You have this platform that is connected to the seabed. It was drilled so that you can extract the, 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 the crude oil. Um, and, and then you have, uh, so after the development, you have um, the, the abandonment. And the abandonment is one once the well or the borehole can no longer produce uh, via its first uh, driving mechanisms. The first driving mechanism, th that's when the reservoir has its own ability to suck out of the hole the crude oil, and that is a mixture of pressure and temperature very technical stuff after this set after this session guys you will be able to explain to your friends what crude is the crude oil markets and the factors that um, are affect supply and demand now that you know that there is a primary mechanism of recovery what comes after primary secondary tertiary yes eor remember enhanced oil recovery secondary is when the primary source of drive of crude um, of crude oil water and gas are no longer there meaning the reservoir doesn't doesn't have the energy the self energy to pull uh, that um the the crude out of the the borehole and as you can imagine this is basically uh, imagine uh, a juice and you open a juice with your straw as soon as you poke that cup of juice you will see the first you know fluid the first juice coming out at a higher pressure why because you just released the pressure but then you need to use a straw to try to suck the juice out of the the cup basically the same thing this force that you use to suck the juice out of the cup is the secondary mechanism that you use to suck the crude oil out of the borehole and tertiary those are more expensive chemical
processes, you know, that includes steam injection, CO2 flooding, gas flooding. Can you imagine? That's a good solution for the for your COP26, um, by the way, you know, CO2 flooding. The CO2 that you produce, you re-inject onto the ground. Is it going to contaminate? No. Why? Because it's treated beforehand so much. Guys, I can give you so much on the technicality behind crude oil because that's literally my backyard. But for the purpose of timing and... Um, and this se and and this session, I just want you to have a little bit of a flavor of the what drives the supply and demand. And so far, physical commodity, physical properties. Now, upstream, exploration and production. Now you know the stages. Exploration, appraisal, development, uh, production and abandonment. Of course, after development, um, after development, you have the production, right? You develop, and that's when you're going to produce. And after production, if there's no more first drive, there's no more first mechanism. That's when you abandon the field, and after you abandon, secondary and um, and tertiary comes into play. Midstream, equally important, guys. This is very important because this is something that Armcore VPI. Uh, also offers of course bear in mind that on top of this supply and demand talk that we're having here if you want to have a full full understanding of what we are discussing you need to go to the Guyana University or University of um, Guyana that is your place um, to go you will hear a lot more rather than just crude we also offer um short technical courses on the crude oil market and i'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor later on five minutes just to show what technical analysis is okay um and i can assure you that you develop a further interest from that so if you want to know if you want to know all the courses that are available and if you want to discuss this in more in depth then you can always get in touch with the university of um, of Gayada and um, and, and yeah they'll be able to um, tell you all the courses that uh, they offer don't forget what we meant all the the sites that we mentioned initially the sites of communication back to midstream and downstream what is midstream it is there trading transport i tend to build the supply and demand of the crude oil markets around three important pillars of the energy economics sustainability affordability and security of supply when it comes to sustainability that's when we're talking about co2 cope 26 protect the world protect the environment all the necessary all the relevant processes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions appetite from the major oil consumers and uh, and regulation from um for both really the consumers and the producers by opec to make sure that um there is enough crude oil supply in the market to meet um the demand so trading why do we trade we're going to see a little bit um ahead but we tend to trade because we want to we want supply to um to meet the demand and basically we want to take advantage of the crude oil market um arbitrage and arbitrage simply means that the price in one region is uh, um, more favorable than the price in another region so you're going to use the transportation which is vessels and vessels for crude vessels uh, you have different types of uh, different types and different um uh um sizes but the most uh, what the most common that you're going to find is the vlcc very large crude carrier vlcc and it has the ability to carry up to two million barrels of crude oil what is important to know on this trading part is that crude oil uh is usually trade on a barrel per day unit and uh statistics show that there around 
40 million barrels uh, are traded on a daily basis for crude whilst for products and for crude and pro uh, for uh, crude products we're talking about gasoline we're talking about diesel we're talking about jet carol gas oil that's half of the, what the crude is trading meaning uh, usually 20 millions of products are traded on a daily basis and are tr um, and are transported via VLCCs for instance very large crude carriers from uh, let's say from uh, um, OPEC countries like Saudi Arabia going to far east um, I can give you an example because I have a spreadsheet with me and I'm just going to I know that you cannot see but just hear me out on that I'm going to select um, Saudi um, Saudi Arabia or even yeah let's choose Saudi Arabia because those those are the the biggest producers um, and I'm going to see where it is going to I see a lot of flows usually Saudi Ar the flows out of Saudi Arabia they go to uh, they go to China China is one of the biggest uh, uh, con consumers and you can see in this picture here Asia Pacific those tend to go to uh, what we call JKT Japan Korea Taiwan and JKTC really Japan Korea Taiwan and China with China uh, being the main consumer or the main importer of crude oil in the Asia Pacific who comes um, uh, later who comes after uh, even though we say North America and probably driven by not probably very likely driven by the US but the US they have indigenous shale gas and shale oil shale gas and shale oil is from slide that we saw slide number one unconventional and why is this important because unconventional uh, reservoirs especially in the US that they have a lot of it it is a massive disruption to the pricing industry basic rules of supply and demand basic rules of macroeconomics if you have too much of something then the prices need to go down because there is an abundance however in conditions of scarcity when you don't have enough products in the market then the prices need to push up because the commodity becomes more expensive those who have that commodity then are able to trade at a higher uh, much higher price really so um at least in europe i want you just to 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 give you um an understanding i, w I know that i was sell I, I was telling you the reason that we trade which is buy to meet demand or sell the production and then of course you are going to trade for profit as well um you have many 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 trading strategies which we will not dive into details here but one of them is spread uh trading and i'm going to show you this in the platform another one that we have is through financial derivatives at, at the very beginning we mentioned the importance of financial derivatives and those are um those are not uh, physical commodities those are electronic commodities and you have many many like swaps you have uh, um, futures uh, you, you you have uh, options you have many many financial derivatives that can be traded with crude oil as the underlying um, commodity and now we mentioned supply um, being driven by these physical properties what about um, the demand very very straightforward crude uses crude is exclusively used for refining into products cdu crude distillation unit that's a refinery operation that is a refinery operation which consists of a lot of um, um physical processes which involve separation of the fractions you need to um remember when we were talking about the the the, the gas the the reservoirs that oil is at the very bottom because of its density then is water and then it's gas basically what the crude distillation unit does the cdu is to operate um 
by the same standards or the same way that a natural reservoir would uh, operate. You are going to have light fractions like gas, methane being produced at the very top and then at the middle of the column you're going to have the middle distillate and the more heavier fraction like uh, the VGO, vacuum gas oil and all these heavy products that cannot be um, broken down initially then they go to the bottom of CDU then they're going to have a lot of chemical processes and a lot of treating treating is to remove contaminants we mentioned that metals and sulfur are contaminants and that's what a CDU does processes desulfurization demethylation how great these names sound they also sound very expensive so these are uh, a couple of refining processes that really occur downstream and then of course you have the marketing and marketing falls under the benchmarks your brand crude your wti and the the dubai for example and we we mentioned that asia uh, in terms of consumption we're talking about the jktc japan korea taiwan and uh, and china china being the main one um we we need to mention that the crude oil producers as well and of course we mentioned in north america they self-sustainable because of um of the shell gas and is it, it's really no surprise that they are top producers but of course the top top producers when it comes to crude oil um we are talking about opec countries right um um opec countries with two-thirds look, look at these statistics which is crazy so opec has uh, basically fi <coughs> 15 members or so two-thirds of the um, of the members they which is basically um uh, saudi arabia i mean two-thirds of, of of those opec they are middle east countries so we're talking about saudi arabia of course iran uae and um kuwait iraq so basically the middle east has a big saying in opec meetings because those are the top producers of crude and of course the ability for the us to be self um sustainable with the shell oil and shell gas then gives them a big position on the table so again opec we're talking about saudi arabia so every time you 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 hear uh, you 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 hear about opec just remember um saudi arabia middle east us china russia and europe those are the main players why europe calls for a big europe because it calls for sustainability there are a lot of projects cop 26 once again in europe which curb um, the use of crude oil it's more about uh gas it's more about renewables solar and wind for example for um, electricity generation that is another um, another thing that comes to to mind look at the use of the crude oil look at the use of other sources crude oil is mainly used for refining into products diesel jet and heavy fuel and it's used premium for transportation your car is powered by gasoline or diesel however in europe regulations legislations you have the evs so to what extent and we are going to see uh, um, in a couple of uh, final slides to what extent are the evs the electrical vehicles going to disrupt the crude oil market since the crude oil market is a uh, used is premium use for transportation now we are seeing a lot of ev um, uh, development um, you have self-charging uh, power plants you know so how is the crude oil market going to adapt in light of all this development in technology now if somebody asks you where where do you see crude what, what what we really need to say is that although we have all these sources of renewable sure we have wind we have um solar uh, but let's talk about for example in terms of a car how long will it take you to 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 power um to to, to power a car a battery uh you know is it sustainable in, of course in terms of sustainability when it comes to co2 it is um it is very sustainable uh, but there are a couple of questions that we really need to answer and the most uh, pertinent question that we have is between crude and gas because gas europe uses a lot of gas because um russia 
has a lot of leverage on gas in when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, supplying Europe. Europe is trying to get rid of crude. Basically, Europe needs Russia. And why is this important? Because crude is here to is here for a little longer because gas prices are indexed to crude. You want to get rid of crude, right? But you still indexing another commodity like gas to crude. So that separation, that segregation of commodities is going to be very, very difficult. But hey, the good news for those uh, renewable, for those intermittent sources or for those for, for the transition, right, which is basically what COP26 challenge is all about, transition from the crude era to a um, renewable source or to a more sustainable sources of energy, gas will play a massive part in that transition period. However, gas prices, gas contracts are indexed to crude oil. And until we're able to segregate that pricing structure, then, ga then oil or crude oil is pretty much here for a long time. These slides, uh, basically just a definition how I tend to conduct my market analysis based um, uh, market analysis on the crude oil market um, factors affecting the commodity market crude supply production oil and product demand consumption we have seen this by now you you are expert price maintain balance by OPEC we have seen a couple of OPEC countries Saudi Arabia basically think Middle East Saudi Arabia Qatar Iran Iraq and of course you have a lot of the African nations don't forget Angola Nigeria you have Gabon Algeria in North Africa um, you have Venezuela Venezuela is also a big producer and um, uh, so, so, so so yeah so th those are the countries when when we think about OPEC US even though um, they, they are not OPEC, but they have a big saying, US is a self-sustainable. Seasonality, um, products, gasoline, diesel, and jet. They have a, season, a seasonality attached to them. Why? Gasoline is used for in a driving season to power up your car engines in the US. So there is a driving season in the US and that tends to be summer. Weather is nice. Everybody wants to wants to drive, or even in a, in when it comes to other commodities like gas, right? Um, that's one of the 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 difference between gas and crude. The use for these commodities, gas, um, crude, as we saw, it's mainly for industrial purpose, transportation, and uh, crude fractions, crude products. But gas is used for heat generations and, and electricity, for example. We use gas in the UK to heat up our home. So you can use LPG, which is liquefied petroleum gas at the end of the day. Then refinery operations, sustainability, affordability, security of supply. These will be your best friends trying to explain the crude oil market. Um, and public opinion. Public opinion, when it comes to fracking, Fracking is associated to uh, shell gas. Unconventional reservoir fracking is a way of breaking, applying too much pressure into a rock and breaking that reservoir. A lot of people say that it contaminates, it contaminates the the reservoir, um, or it can even be public opinion on crude not being good versus renewables being good. And this is just a note of what drives the market, basically, that we have seen um, around. The shocks, the financial shocks. And we saw that during the financial crisis, a lot of financial settled contracts were at risk. And many of those risks were liquidity. How much, uh, how quick or how, how quick you can sell uh, and buy a commodity, you know, and we're talking about uh, spreads, bid and offer. The tighter the spread, the better the liquidity because it means that prices uh, bid which is buying price and offer which is the uh, high selling price they are being met on a constant base you have credit liquidity contracts need to be traded between people or between organizations so credit means that you have a good credit rating i'm going to trade with you you don't have a good credit rating i'm not going to trade with you because if you default if you have credit problems, you're not going to pay my money. This is just basically like people dealing with each other. I'm not going to, uh, you cannot borrow from me. You cannot borrow money from me because um, you don't have the ability to return that money to me, basically. Market risk, market prices. 
market prices regulated by price uh, from OPEC, uh, maintain the balance between supply and demand, and operational. Crisis means no money. No money means that wells, boreholes are not being drilled. No drilling, no oil coming out of the, of the borehole. If you don't have oil, you have shortage, and whoever holds that barrel of crude oil will be able to have a leverage on the pricing. All these is very, very correlated. We moving into um, the final slides, and this is basically a little bit of a repetition to to what we have been seeing the drivers and the players. What drives trades? Buy to meet demand, sell the production, and uh, the these are the financial contracts, paper or forward contracts, and then you also have futures, the derivatives, for example, futures, uh, swaps, options, exchange of physical for swaps. Um, so, um, and all these type of contracts. And who is the player? We have seen OPEC, the big guys, the big guns regulating, but the ones that I have in this uh, slide, these are, um, you know, Europeans, uh, or, yeah, th these are um, the, the, the biggest, let's put that way. So you have the major oil company, BP, British Petroleum, Chevron, Exxon, Shell, large incorporate um integrated oil uh companies total repsol um any or eni uh, if you wish that's the italian um company then you have the national um, oil companies pemex that's uh petroleum of mexico saudi aramco from saudi stat oil from stat oil i think is yeah norway um kpc is kuwait ptt is the uh thai from thailand uh and npc is the nigerian so you have a lot of um players in the market from major oil uh nocs the national oil companies um Refiners, Valero uh, US, Reliance India, SR US, and Caltex. Traders, you have all these Vitol, Trophy, Mercury, and Gunvor. So it, it is a lot of market participants. But remember, guys, what are these uh, guys doing to the market? They're adding liquidity to the market. That's what they're doing. And just to answer one of the questions here that a lot of people tend to ask me what is the difference between crude market, stock market, crude market, FX market? stock market you own your stock right you own a share of apple put it in your pocket put it in your bank that's yours take it home with you that's yours crude oil you cannot do that you do not own a barrel of crude oil unless you're super billionaire and you buy crude oil just for the sake of buying crude oil and st staring at it but you do not buy you do not own crude oil. You are what you're doing effectively is to speculate on the position of the crude oil. And how do you speculate? I'm going to show how you speculate, bay, and we uh, we can call that, or we can do that via technical trading analysis, which is a course that guess who offers, Armcore VPI offers that course, short term crude oil technical analysis we offer that course for you and i'm just going to show that very quickly soon in the next couple of minutes so to conclude guys it's scope 26 now we need to you know we need to conclude this session and then the last five minutes i'm going to show um a little bit of the platform and the technical analysis fundamental analysis how is the world of energy changing trends your friends, sustainability, affordability, and security of supply. So, what I want you to take is a couple of these points that I have. Convergence of cheaper renewable energy technology. Technology, technology, technology. It's a big driver. Wind and solar. Solar farms, wind uh, plants, uh, uh, CCGT, combined uh, cycle gas turbines for power generation. So a lot of technology, um, you know, the trend in the energy um, in the energy transition period also depends on the technology type that you have to generate um, to generate um, energy, basically to generate either electricity, which is what gas is mainly used for, what these renewables are mainly used for. So a lot of it will depend on China's or even Asia consumption appetite. You know, we, we, we need to 
um, we, we we need to see whether China is going to con is going to remain the main importer of the of crude oil or Asia Pacific or Asia in, in general. You know, any big push or any shift in that con in that consumption in that demand profile then is going to affect the the crude oil market. And then remember, people people keep um, um, demographic uh, people general population or global population keep on increasing you know with um, global with the rise of uh, demographics let's say that more and more people need the basics and electricity is one of the basics right so what is the source of um, of fuel for electricity generation surely it's not crude because crude is mainly used as we saw for refinery and for um, automotive industry is it gas? Is it renewable? Cars powered by batteries, batteries that are powered by solar? Maybe, but guess what? Gas is indexed to crude oil. To, to crude oil. So how are we going to price that? That's basically um, the homework for the COP26 uh, challenge. You know, I'm giving you a couple of tips on where to look and basically the oil challenges, really. And that is um, as of 2018, which is pretty much... Um, uh, uh, which pretty much reflect the the current reality and if you just look the oil supplies uh, climate change that was two weeks ago even though we say 2018 but the challenges continue what the challenges continue what we are doing is to implement technology to help us um, solve these challenges reduction in the subsidies and marketing uh, mark, uh, market pricing subsidies means reduction of subsidies for crude oil projects um, at the expense of uh, renewable um, projects. Low sulfur um, legislation. Remember, sulfur, IMO, International Maritime um, Organization, it came about in Jan 2020 and it was about pollution in the seas, right? Because vessels, um, they power, they, uh, it depends on the type of fuel, um, used to power their vessels on um on on the sea gas oil 10 ppm that is ulsd ultra low sulfur diesel and that is a lower spec of gas oil that is going to power the engine so lng um, is another viable source that have vessels that will carry your crude from point a to point b um uh, being powered by lng or by lng remember it will depend on the calorific value that is required to burn um spark the yeah to burn create heat in the engine similar to uh, what this ulsd the ultra low sulfur diesel does or fuel oil fuel oil being um one of the heavy fractions of crude oil and china 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 changing energy landscape <laughs>